Hello, welcome to Premier Scene. I'm Claire Bueno, where we're here at the world premiere of The Aftermath with the beautiful Kira Knightley. When we see your character, I felt that she was lost and she comes into this big house, which seems to amplify that. Is that something that you got when you read the script? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think she's not just lost. I think she's um, grieving in a very extreme way and, uh, and has lost utterly who she is and her entire life, you know, I mean, so yeah, and I and I think, you know, the, the the house in this film is very much a character in this film, you know, she, it's about the, the English occupation of Hamburg after the w World War II, and they did repossess German people's houses with all of their uh, belongings in them and, and live in them, so it, it's a very strange thing to kind of go into somebody's home and, you know, take all of their possessions, <laughs> I should imagine. So yes, I think that's a very big part of the film, yeah. Um, what was refreshing um, from, from your character, what I thought was, um, we see two sides of the story, that there are casualties of war from from both nations. Yeah. Um, was that something that attracted you in the script? Uh, that was that was precisely what attracted me. I thought it was uh, quite refreshing to read something that was more nuanced and, uh, than uh, some of the stories that come out, come out of this, this era. Um, a lot of them are depicted in a very black and white way, where good guys versus bad guys. And I, I don't subscribe to that narrative, that notion really. I think it's way more interesting and way more real if you can see the suffering on both sides and uh, that they were all victims. Loss. Yeah, he, tremendous loss on both sides, obviously. Yeah. What I saw about your character was there was this huge amount of humanity in him. Is, is that what you felt when you read the part? Yeah, it's hard not to. It's hard not to when you, you, know, you watch the, you know, the documentaries on World War II and it's hard not to when you... You see what the Germans suffered at the end of World War II and, you know, and the mess that, that they were in. You know, and a lot of them didn't ask for it. They weren't part of it. You know, they were shopkeepers and sons and daughters and kids and 10-year-olds and, you know, they had no legs and no food. You know, so, you know, it's, it's, easy, it's hard not to feel some kind of empathy. Um, you know, it's hard to get in touch with the anger, I guess, you know, that, that a lot of the other people felt towards, you know, Lewis for trying to put them back together, bringing a German into the house and all that, you know. And, but um, in the end of the day, you've got to... You can build it or you can destroy it. And, you know, and I love that Lewis chose to build it, you know, as, a, as, a, as an English colonel and as a, you know, a husband. What I loved about your character is that nothing really escapes her, does it? She's really got her eye to business. Yeah, right. So I think she arrives in, in Hamburg with a, a, a real... Uh, she holds a lot of prejudice towards the Germans when she arrives in Hamburg and she's offered up these pamphlets that tell her how to prepare when she arrives into the city. And she's been living in London, she's been bombarded with a lot of propaganda against the German people, so she arrives with, you know, an agenda. Um, and that's something that Rachel's able to overcome throughout the course of the film and, and Susan doesn't quite get there. It's interesting as well because um, with, with the kind of work that, that James Kent goes into, it, everything is about authenticity. So the, the, the part that you're playing is, is actually that comes from a place of truth. Yeah, so you've got this woman who is flawed. Um, she's not particularly the nicest character in the world, but she obviously is still a, a fully rounded human being. So there are moments of kindness and warmth, whilst also um, being social climbing and, and um, not altogether pleasant. So finding those um, sort of uh, yeah, nuances is, is, was really exciting. Um, one thing I. James was, was quite keen that I didn't fall into the classic period RP voice, <laughs> which um, I really struggled, struggled to do, because of course these people are still human, you know, they're not just human. And that's the thing, isn't it? You've got to find kind of the humanity and the character and not make a judgment call as to whether this person is good or bad. Absolutely, no, totally. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to empathise with your character, otherwise you can't play them as a normal person. I would imagine when you read this script, this was a, an opportunity you couldn't turn down. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. The, it's a really, really beautiful script and, and an amazing book. And then the opportunity to work with, with, with James and, and Jason and Kira and Alex was uh, really, really incredible. And I think what's wonderful about this script as well is that it really is an actor's piece, isn't it? Mm, yeah. Uh, can, you, can you tell us more about, about the character that you were playing and, um, and what, what you got from being a part of the yeah, so I play Barker. Uh, Barker is a young Irish private who is uh, um, Jason Clark's character, Lewis Morgan's driver. Um, but uh, but yeah, so that, that that's who I play. That's probably all I can say uh, without giving anything away. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it was amazing. It was it was an amazing 
experience to, to work on this film and, and one thing that was so lovely about it was that everyone was so nice you know and these these are people who I've looked up to uh, you know my, my whole life and uh, yeah so it was incredible to to work with them and, and have them be so caring and, and generous. And Jason really is is superb in this film isn't he? Acting against him must have been a real delight and you must have learned such a lot. Yeah, absolutely. He's incredible. We had a little bit of rehearsal time before we, um, yeah, before we started filming, and then, yeah, every day working with him was was amazing. And and he's such a generous actor and so lovely on and, and off camera. And uh, yeah, I learned I learned loads from him. And working on, on a story like this that that's so much based on authenticity and, and facts, what happened. I imagine on a personal level, it must have been a real education. Absolutely, that's one thing that's that's really amazing about working on, uh, on on things like this is that you get to learn so much about the time that it's that it's said. I, I really, uh, I I, di I really didn't know a lot about this uh, time time in history. I knew I knew a lot about the the, the war and uh, and everything, but no, but not really, uh, yeah, not not really about this specific time. So that's one thing that's really really cool is that you get to find out more and more about uh, yeah about it. The thing I found, like when I watched the film, uh, was that it's a film that resonates with you. It lingers, and you you find yourself going back to it. Um, is that something that you found when you first read the script? Well, yes, of course. I can only judge as a director whether something lingers and how I respond to it. If it lingers with me, well, that's the best clue I've got that it's going to linger with an audience. And I think that I like the fact. Some people say, "Oh, why didn't?" I won't give the game away, but why wasn't it a different ending? And I go, "Well, the different ending would have made it so simple." This ending makes you think about it. It's really true, actually. And the, the thing as well, if I can com compare it to Testament of Youth, is the commonality is that how war affects individuals yes. and, the, and literally the aftermath. Yes. Again, was that a theme that continues to interest you post-war? It does, actually. I mean, it's, it's probably not a coincidence that I've made two films, both about, in a way, what follows after war and... Um, I'm just amazed by how people deal with their grief and get over it and move on. And, and I want this film to be an inspiration for anybody who's lost anybody to, to, to feel that they can rebuild themselves. Actually, time is a great healer. And I think what's really refreshing about this film as well is that we see the story from both sides. The effect that war and the impact that it's had yeah. on, on, on both nations, actually. Was that important for you to, to convey that lack of bias? You know what, that's for me the most important message of the film because Germans are not very often shown to have been victims of the war just like we were. But of course they were. Hamburg was bombed just like London. In fact, it was much worse than London. The bombs that fell on Hamburg in three days was the same as the total dropped on London over the entire war. It was interesting for me learning that from the film. So for authenticity, I imagine that the factual ac accuracy was paramount. Yeah, we were very, very careful about that. We had military consultants, we had medical consultants. I mean, we had more consultants than you'd think for a film that's mostly set in the house. But, but it's, you know, it's just important to get those facts right, it really is. Touching upon that house, actually, if I may, there's... Um, I think when we see Kira Knightley's um, part, when she comes in, she's kind of lost, and this house actually amplifies her, that feeling it of does. being lost. I'm glad you understood that, because it's very much is that sense that she's alienated from the world. She's a, an ordinary middle-class housewife, and she's in this enormous house with servants, and it's like, I really didn't need this. I really didn't need these paintings. Can't we just be somewhere, just the two of us? That's it from the world premiere of the thought-provoking The Aftermath. Please remember to give us a like and subscribe so we ensure we see you next time.